we'll do that then. Are you going to edit this? This is edited, so if if okay. uh, if we need to restate something or if you need to stop for a break or anything like that, just let me know. No, I don't need a break. I teach for an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> this is easy stuff for you. Yes, it is. I, all right. You ready to get started? Yep. All right, all right, all right, lead heads. We are back with another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast, and we've got a really good one for you guys today. I've been uh, anxiously awaiting this interview, and I know that you lead heads are going to love it too. But if you haven't had the opportunity yet, make sure you go back to last episode where our guest was none other than Caltech Chad Chad Enos with Caltech Weapons. And we talked about their new sub-2000 CQB integrally suppressed 9mm rifle. Uh, it's going to be an awesome rifle for you guys. And, of course, you know, it. unfortunately, there's going to be that tax stamp that's involved with the suppressor that's on it. But it's just one tax stamp that you have to deal with. You don't have to deal with the SBR tax stamp. So make sure you go back, listen to that episode. And we took care of some jack wagons and some Leadhead Brigade heroes. Uh, and then Chad also gave us some insight on what's coming from Caltech down the road, and you're not going to be disappointed. So this week, I'm very proud to have this guest on, and his name is Dr. Jack Schaefer. And Dr. Schaefer is a professor at Western Illinois University in the Law Enforcement and Justice Administration Department. He is a retired FBI special agent. He served as behavioral analyst assigned to FBI's National Security Behavioral Analysis Program. He authored a book titled Psychology Narrative Analysis, a professional method to detect deception in written and oral communications. This is really what intrigues me right here. He also co-authored a book titled Advanced Interviewing Techniques, Proven Strategies for Law Enforcement, Military, and Security Personnel. So my LE and military listeners are really going to dig this also. Uh, and he's got a new book out that we're going to talk about. It's called The Truth Detector. Uh, and then he's got one prior to that. It was called The Like Switch, a very popular uh, book that he put out. Uh, it's an ex-FBI agent's guide to influencing, attracting, and winning people over. So let's give a warm Leadhead Brigade welcome to Dr. Jack Schaefer. Jack, welcome in. Thank you for having me. Well, we appreciate you joining us on such short notice. Uh, your your publisher there, Simon and Schuster, David, uh, was very gracious in uh, setting this up. So big thanks to David for doing that. So, Doctor Jack, do you go by Doctor Jack, Doctor Schaefer? What do you want me to call you? Just Jack. Jack Schaefer is good. Jack. Jack. Okay, I like. That's yeah. a good name, Jack. It's a good American solid name there. <laughs> So you you were with the FBI for how many years? Twenty years. Twenty years with the FBI. Okay. Yeah. When did you and retire? I in uh, twenty oh five. So I've been retired fifteen years now. For a minute, yeah. So talk about a little bit about uh, how that profession came about. How you how you got wound up with the FBI? Well, I was a police officer at uh, Hinsdale, Illinois, for five years. And uh, I wanted a little more excitement, so I decided to, you know, get to a place where I had a bigger backyard to play in. So I was fortunate enough to be accepted in the FBI. And my initial uh, job in the FBI was a pilot. So oh, I served wow. as a pilot. So I, I flew for about three years, and then I got kind of tired of that. And I worked homicides on the Indian Reservation in southwest Arizona, the Hopi and Navajo tribes. Yeah. Interesting. And I got kind of bored with that. And then I uh, volunteered to go to language school. I learned Korean and went to Monterey Defense Language Institute. And then I went to uh, Los Angeles and worked uh, counterintelligence. In other words, I caught spies. Right. And then uh, I worked the skinheads for a while. And then uh, I ended up in the behavioral analysis unit. When you say you worked the skinheads, did you go undercover with that? Did you do some undercover work? No, no, no. No, uh, I investigated a lot of uh, white supremacist activities in Lancaster, California in the 
mid nineties. Yeah. And, uh, they they were having a lot of trouble. So they brought the FBI in and they assigned me to that case. So I worked that for probably three or four years. Yeah. Keith likes everything about the great outdoors. He's a lot like us. Whether we're bow hunting in the backcountry or plinking in the backyard, we want to enjoy each experience to the fullest. kel 22 caliber P-17 is Heath's go-to pistol for a good time. On the range, on the trail, and anywhere in between. Weighing in at only 14 ounces with a full magazine, its compact size makes it easy to conceal or tuck away in a small pack, pocket, or space. It comes out of the box ready with a fiber optic front sight, a threaded barrel, a Picatinny rail, and a price point for any budget. With three 16-round magazines, it's ready for hours of pure, unadulterated enjoyment. It's easy, it's affordable, it's accurate, and it's a damn sweet marvel of plinking innovation. The Keltec P-17. It's more bang for less buck. So you, you mentioned that you were a pilot also. Uh, I've got a aviation background myself. Uh, I got a degree in aerospace uh, oh, okay. admi- administration. I did a little pro piloting as well. What did you fly? Did you say a Cessna two hundred and ten turbo? Okay. W- was it just uh, carting people around back and forth, or what? Uh, no, it was. Uh, it was mostly surveillance. Surveillance. We ran surveillance. Yeah, we followed people around. We flew around and followed people across the country. So you were doing. You were following ground targets. Yeah, in cars typically. Yeah. Did you have like markers or, or something like that that you used to to keep track of? Well, there's there's certain there's certain techniques we can use. Yeah. Is that something that you can I'd talk just about? Rather leave, <laughs> I'd rather leave. I'd rather leave those unspoken. <laughs> Putting some of that IR paint on the on the roofs <laughs> of the cars. Well, let's just say we had some techniques that that I'm I'm not at liberty to discuss. I got you. I got you. Very cool. So you got because then they won't work. Then they won't work, will they? If I tell everybody what we do. Well, I mean, they do on the TV shows. They they spill it all on the TV shows anyway, don't they? Sometimes. Well, we'll just let the we'll let the writers of the TV shows have their way then. I got you. So you got a very diverse background. Um, did now when you were in college, was psychology was that your course of study? Yeah, I I did a major in psychology and a minor in criminal justice. And I always had a interest in behavior. And I, I remember as a kid, my mom and would take us to the mall, the kids to the mall. And I would sit at a chair in the mall and just watch people. People watch. And my, yeah, my mom was going like, what are you doing? I was just watching people. She said, no, you can get out and walk around and, you know, do stuff. I said, no, I, I'm having fun just watching people. So from that point, I, I always had an interest in behavior. And then when I got into the uh, FBI, then they asked me to join a behavioral analysis program. And that's a little bit different than what you see on TV, because the TV uh, show, usually there's people at a crime scene Mm -hmm. and they try to figure out who committed the crime. Well, Well, we did something a little bit different. Yeah. I was going to say, that'll be a good good segue into our, our facts to fight the myth segment. So why don't we just do that right now? Now, it's time for the Talking Lead Facts to Fight the Myths. Uh, This is Dr. Jack Schaefer's Facts to Fight the Myths, and uh, it's going to deal with... Yeah, TV shows. The difference between TV show, being a behavioral analyst on a TV show, and being a real behavioral analyst. (laughs) Okay. So, what, what people have to understand is there's two types of behavioral analysts in the FBI. There's the criminal profiler, and then there's a behavioral analyst. The criminal profile will go to a crime scene and try to figure out who did it based on the artifacts and the evidence at the crime scene. So let's say it's a, somebody that knows them, somebody that doesn't know them. It's, it's a stranger. It's a uh, uh, organized crime scene, disorganized crime scene, and they try to figure out who did it. We in the behavioral analysis program typically have a subject, a subject we're looking at to either recruit to be a spy for us, to confess to being a spy. And we take everything about their personality. We sit in a room, dissect their personality, find their weaknesses, and then we would develop strategies that take advantage of that person's weaknesses to get them to confess. So the the big difference is 
on TV, they're always right. They always find the right answer. They always find the right guy. But in real life, you know, when we consider if we're over 51 percent right, we consider that good. Right. Because people. Yeah. Yes. People are different. And you could put a person in in one set of circumstances today. They'll act a certain way. You could put them in the same set of circumstances two weeks from now. The probability is they're going to act the same way, but not necessarily because they're humans. Right. So there's no set. Yeah, they're unpredictable. And that's what we have to we're, we're faced with is the unpredictability of humans. So how do you kind of make sense out of that? And that's the it's it's an art versus a science, I would say. It's a skill. So yeah. It's a skill. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't work as well as it does on TV. Right. I wish it did because I would be very, very successful. Shows like the CSI line of shows. Uh, we were talking yeah, CSI, about one in Criminal particular. Minds. Lie to Me was was on yeah. a few years ago. Um, very good show. I enjoyed it. Entertaining. And I always wondered, you know, how much of that was, was actual. Uh, you, were, well, you, you were talking about a, a couple of, of scenes on there that just didn't really add up. The handshake scene. Yeah, there's a there's a handshake scene where he uh, shakes a person's hand and then talks to the person, asks them some questions, and then when the person's leaving, he shakes the person's hand again. And he said, based on the temperature change between the first handshake and the second handshake, indicated that the person was lying. <laughs> that is <laughs> this does not comport with the research, right? Because with nonverbals, you got to remember nonverbals. Are only they only indicate physiological changes in your body due to the fight flight response, and if there's no fight flight response induced, then there will be no nonverbal indicators of deception. So I have to induce detection apprehension. In other words, I have to make you believe that you're going to get thro- uh, caught, and I have to be seen as a threat to you yeah. to catch you. Then you go into the fight flight response. So if I'm just having a general conversation with you and there's no fear of any consequences when you lie to me, your fight flight response will not kick in. And if it doesn't kick in, then you have no nonverbal indicators of deception. Right. So you've got to trigger so, those. You got, you've got yes. techniques to trigger those. Yeah. What's called inducing detection apprehension. So in other words, I have to tell you, and we use this technique. I, I can get into one quick technique we sure. use. Uh, if you and I are walking into uh, an interview room and we're going to interview a suspect, you're my partner. I'm going to I'm going to tell you you got an emergency phone call right when we get into the interview room, and so I'm going to sit down with the suspect then while you're gone and say I really like you because you're you're honest and you listen to both sides of the story. But the reason I hang out with you is because you you are a human lie detector. No matter how sophisticated that lie is, you can pick it up. So then you walk back in the room and we set a filter through which we want that person to see this, to see you. And that filter is you're a human lie detector. So I asked him, I said, told, I told you prior, I said, told my partner, I say, don't say anything till I ask him if he robbed the bank. And when he says he didn't rob the bank, give him one of those weird looks like, whoa, what a liar you are. So I asked him, did you rob the bank? My buddy looked at him and said, what a liar are you? And the guy slapped his hand on the table and said, damn, he's good. <laughs> so, but we didn't, ch- we didn't change reality. Right. We changed the person's perception of reality. And that's what behavioral analysis is about. How do we get people to think what we want them to think, not what reality is? Right. And you, and, go, over and these, we, you go over these techniques in, uh, are these the textbooks that these techniques are yeah. in? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the like switch has it in uh, the interviewing book. But but don't we do that in high school? If you All like life. somebody, yeah. If yeah, if you if you like somebody, you can't walk up to them and say, "Hey, I like you," because that what if they reject you? Then you're you're humiliated. Right. So you talk to a friend who tells that friend, "Oh, he likes you," and that sets up a what filter through which that person sees you. Right. And if they like you, then they're going to welcome you. Next time you get near them, if they don't like you, they're going to run away, go the opposite direction. Yeah, and it, and it seems like a lot of these these techniques are just they're innate behaviors that are 
that we just we have naturally as well. You know, yes. you go and you talk about, you know, some of these facial tales uh, when you approach people, whether you can tell somebody's approachable or whether they're welcoming or not. Talk about some of those uh, telltale signs. Yeah, there's, there, there's three basic friend signals that people use every day and they don't realize they're using them. The first one is the eyebrow flash. That's a quick up and down movement of the eyebrows. It lasts about one sixty fourth of a second. When people greet one another, they exchange eyebrow flashes. Yeah. And the eyebrow flashes simply mean I am not a threat to you. And you reciprocate and say, I'm not a threat to you. So what happens in the morning when you see somebody, you I, you typically go, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Yeah. And Your the next time eyes you get wider. Person, yeah. And the next time you see that person, you don't have to say, hey, how you doing? What do we do? We eyebrow flash one another or we do the chin thing. Guys do the chin thing. Yeah. So that's another. They jut their chin out. Yeah, and that's up, a bro. friend stick. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> so so what the, that is just a nonverbal signal that says I'm not a threat. The second one is the head tilt. If you tilt your head to one side or the other side, what you're doing is exposing your carotid artery, which is very vulnerable. Right. So you're telling that other person, look, I trust you enough. I'm exposing a vulnerable part of my body to this you is what, because this, I trust you. Yeah, if, you, you know, if you're into to the animal and animalistic behavior, that's what animals do when they're you know, either being submissive or uh, you know, to, to another of their kind. Yeah, you know, example I like to use is if, if anybody's a dog owner and the, the owner walks into the house – the dog will sit there and tilt its head one way or the other to say, I'm not a threat. Or they'll flip over flash and expose belly. their yeah, to <laughs> yeah. flash the belly, which is a, a very vulnerable part of their body. Yeah. So the dog is saying, hey, look, I'm exposing my most vulnerable part because I trust you. Right. And that's what that head tilt does. Saying, I'm a good boy. I'm a good boy. Rub my ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Big sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes a ritual. <laughs> right, yeah. Then then you got to do it every time. The last friend signal, the major friend signal is a smile. And what happens when we smile, people don't realize that when we smile, we release endorphins. And endorphins makes us feel good about ourselves. So when I smile at you and you smile back, you're releasing endorphins. And the rule, the golden rule of friendship is if I can make you feel good about you, you're going to like me. So it's kind of built into that smile. So I'm going to smile at you. You're going to smile back. I get a uh, shot of uh, endorphins. You get a shot of endorphins. And then it develops that mutual trust. Right. And your brain can tell whether you're issuing a real smile or a fake smile, typically by the crow's feet around your eyes. The eyes are the telltale, right? Yeah. Your your cheeks kind of rise up, and then it, it causes the crow's feet on either either you know, edge of your eyes and your brain automatically picks it up. Unless so you're you on Botox. Fix, yeah. Well, <laughs> right. That, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, you could, if somebody's on Botox and they don't eyebrow flash or smile properly, their spouse may say, Hey, that person doesn't like me anymore. Yeah. So consciously. So she's fixing herself up for somebody else, not me. Cause she's not giving me those friend signals anymore. Getting that so insecurity. There's a yeah, yeah. There's a downside to the Botox. Yeah. But if you want a fake smile, just make sure you got your crow's feet working. Go yeah. fully commit to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> fully That's commit right. to that fake smile. I was just going to say, you know, earlier I was in the gym today. And, you know, when you're at the gym, you know, people typically don't talk as much. You know, it's not a, you know, a bar setting where you're going to go in and you're, you're going to have a lot of conversations. But some people do, unfortunately. But, uh, but I noticed, and I was doing this while I was on the treadmill, to just noticing people's how they reacted to one another. And there was a lot of nonverbal, you know, facial body, you know, expressions of the, oh, yeah. the eyebrows, the eyes, the smiling, the head, you know, tilts. Uh, and I was just like, you know, I, I'd never, you know, paid that much attention to it before, but I was like, yeah, I mean, it's just anywhere you go, everywhere, the supermarket, the, the gym, the, you know, and, and people can use these techniques in their jobs as well. Uh, especially oh, yeah. in, in sales, you know, this, I'm sure this, these techniques, uh, are, are huge. Um, and I, I want you to talk about that too, but I'll think about, 
you know, and, and what we talk about here on the show, you know, we're talking lead, we, you know, we're in the firearms community, we talk a lot of self-defense, you know, type things, situational awareness, be aware of your surroundings and the people around you. Talk about how these uh, techniques can come into play, uh, uh, you know, just for your everyday self-defense, you know, kind of way and how to stay away from situations. Well, what, what you want to do is present yourself just the opposite. So you don't use the friend signals. I call this an urban scowl. I grew up on the <laughs> south side of Chicago and it was a kind of a, a rough neighborhood. Yeah. And we force ourselves not to smile. Don't look at people, furl your eyebrows, grit your teeth, you know, and, and it's called the urban scowl. So you walk around and the predators are looking for prey and they look at you and say, Hmm, I better not go with that person because that person is looks like they're ready to fight me right so and it's like the it's like the the expression i like to use is you know i want to look look like you know i'm not going to be vulnerable to you You don't want to look approachable yeah and, and if you do attack me you may be able to it's like a chicken bone you may be able to get me down but you're gonna have a tough time putting me out the other side yeah another so, example of that would be you know, when I travel and especially, you know, when I'm in a foreign country and, you know, you come out of, it's like, say you're on a cruise, you've been on a cruise before. You, yes. know, you come out of port and you go into the city and you're just mobbed by, you know, all these people wanting to sell you stuff. Uh, all the locals wanted to sell you stuff. Um, and of course, if you come out with that smile, jovial, those are the people they're going to go to. But if you've yep. got that look, like you're saying, uh, I found no. that they, they don't want to approach me. <laughs> yeah. And well, all. it's like panhandlers. Uh, when you're walking down the street and somebody comes up and wants to beg money from you, you don't look at them. It's the last thing you want to do. What you want to do is give them the urban scowl, just, yeah. and then don't make eye they contact. won't even approach you. Yeah, they won't approach you. They will find other people that are more vulnerable. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot you can do. You know, what was interesting. My wife was out in the suburbs when I met her. And I, I went out to the suburbs, and of course I carried my urban smile, uh, my urban scowl out to the suburbs, <laughs> and all my you wife's Southie friends smile were like, oh. with you. <laughs> yeah, and they say he's so mean. It looks like he's going to bite my head off if I talk to him. And I said, no, I'm I'm nice. And then then I realized, oh, I'm I'm going to an area where there's not a lot of threats, yeah, or danger. So people don't walk around with the urban scowl as they did in Chicago on the South Side. But that's something you probably so had to learn, didn't you? You had to learn to to get rid of that scowl because growing up you had it as for it's a survival instinct, right? You know, you have that yes. for survival. I was the same way. You know, uh, people initially will take me as callous or you know unapproachable or you know, uh, just just that's just the way I grew up. You know, it's but. I yeah, like it's you. part of you, but then you you have to learn yeah. what environment you're in. And that's why I think the books are good because they what they do is they take these techniques and these things, behaviors that people do all the time, but they don't realize they're doing them. And once they're aware that they're doing them, I'm the same then way. they can yeah. say, what's the appropriate place I can use this tool? Like if I go to the suburbs, urban scowl is not the thing to do, but I know how to soften it. Eyebrow flash, head tilt, and smile. Yeah, and then when I go back into the city, I say, "Okay, this is a dangerous situation. I'll put that urban skull back on," because I wouldn't be able to do it unless I know the variables that go into each of these these uh, presentations you want to make. Right, and nope. that's what I do in the nope. book. Is a lot of people just realize, "Wow, I've been doing this my whole life. I just never knew it." Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's just instinct, natural instinct. The Fiocchi family has been producing high quality ammunition since 1876. In 2020, Fiocchi's launching a full line of premium products, everything from self and home defense to the long range categories. The Fiocchi Blue Guardian line will feature specially tuned products specifically for home and self defense, featuring lead free technology and the only NATO certified zero pollution primer in the world. Fiocchi's a proud sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast and the Leadhead Brigade. Fiocchi trains. Fiocchi protects. So the new book, uh, The Truth Detector, let's talk about that. What uh, what do you go into in this book that maybe you didn't cover in your previous book, The Like? And it's L-I-K-E, 
uh, listeners, like switch. Yeah, well, the truth detector, it, it gets into elicitation. In other words, you want to get people to tell you the truth before they have a chance to lie. Ah. Because we all want to get the best out of life. We want the best relationships. We want the best business deals. We want to get the best, uh, uh, best we can get out of life. But a lot of that information that we need to get the best out of life is kind of secret. It's not well known. So the example I, I, I like to use is you want to know how, how's the, well, I'll give you one example where my wife and I were looking at a house to buy. Okay. And, uh, and somebody I do told real estate us, also. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, and what happened was the, uh, the house we liked, but then we talked to some people and they said the, that it, that it might be in a floodplain. It might flood. So I said, hmm, the real estate person, if I ask him a direct question, does this place flood? He's going to say, of course it doesn't. Well, then he's right? in violation of law if he does that and he knows about well, it. <laughs> or, or, he'll be, or he'll be very evasive. Sure. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And it depends how I ask the question. Does this place flood? Meaning present tense. You could, you could say, no, it doesn't. Right. And still be truthful, can't you? Yep. Yes. So anyway. We thought a better way would be to elicit the information. So we go down into the basement, and I say, wow, this is a nice place. I could, it's all fixed up, so we mm -hmm. can't see the telltale water lines, right? Right. So I mentioned to the person, I said, oh, they did a good job fixing up after the flood. And he says, well, yeah, we put a little dirt around the house, and we did this, and we did that. And I'm going like, the place floods, <laughs> right? So would he? Would we have gotten that direct information if we didn't use elicitation? I, I don't know. I understand. I understand your. Uh, it's a great example, uh, but being a real estate agent, uh, you're lawfully bound to disclose, you know, things like that. Um, and if you don't, then you're, you're in some big trouble. But if, for instance, let's say it's a for sale by owner, and you're doing that. A lot of the for sale by owners don't understand the, the laws and the rules. And yes, I've dealt with the for sale by owners. And of course, I knew it was in a floodplain and I knew that the house had flooded. Uh, but I want them to tell, you know, tell me or tell my clients that themselves. Yeah. And yeah, well, use those techniques just like you said. He's like, you know, this. Well, I'll give you another one. The, the technique I'm describing now is called the presumptive. Okay. What you want to do is you present a fact, whether it's true or not true, you just present a fact. And the person has a predisposition to want to correct others. So if you present a fact that's wrong, people really want to correct you. It's a very strong psychological predisposition. Kind of like what I just did. <laughs> yes, kind of like exactly I, what you just did. I just did, so, did it. Yeah. <laughs> I was able to elicit a lot of information from you based on the presumptive. Yeah. So I remember early in my, my youth, I, I wanted to buy a car. And what do you see? Oh, you open great a hood. Example, on, yeah. You open a hood on the car, and it's spotless. Come on, how many cars are spotless when you're buying a, a six? Well, back then it was a '63 Chevy Bel Air. Oh wow. How many? Of those, how many of those are clean? Yeah. Back then, not many. Then you look in the garage, and you see a little spot. Looks like it's been cleaned up, right? Mm -hmm. So this car leaks oil. Well, why would he clean it? Right. So I said that was my my suspicion. So I said. So I made a presumptive. So are you going to give me a discount because the car leaks oil? <laughs> now, he doesn't know whether I know the car leaks oil or not. Mm -hmm. I just put that fact out. That person has such a need to correct me. And he says, well, it only leaks a little bit. Maybe we can work on the, on the price a little bit so you can get the oil leak fixed. I, I knew the thing leaked. Right. It leaks right? oil, but it's, you know, it's not it. that bad. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's. You say it's not that bad of a leak. Let's go on the bad scale. Low leak meaning one. Ten, a high leak meaning ten. Right. Where would you put that, sir? Rate that for me. <laughs> yeah, incriminate yeah, yourself. It, it, <laughs> yeah, no matter what, no matter what number he picks, it's still leaking. This is this is great stuff. I mean, yes. Yeah, so here's another application that you can use the information that you're going to get from uh, Jack's books. Uh, who doesn't go and buy a car? And who hates dealing with you know, the car salesman. Um, yeah, well, the car salesman can be your friend. 
because I sat down and had a, a dinner with a car salesman at a conference once. And I said, he was a top salesman and one of the top dealers in Georgia. And I said, uh, I got to find all the secrets of what happens when you buy a car. So I elicited the information. I said, oh, you're a pretty good car salesman. You see, I said, you must know a lot of tricks to, you know, the trade. And there's a lot of ins and outs. Oh, yeah. And, and what I'm doing is I'm, it's another technique is I'm, it's a lecturer's temptation. So what I'm trying to do is get him to demonstrate through lecture his expertise in a ah, field. Yes. And don't we always want to demonstrate our expertise? Because that's where we get our de- identity from, isn't it? Right. So I knew that he would have to demonstrate his expertise. So he started lecturing me on all the, the deals you can get for a car. One thing I didn't realize, there's something called a holdback. There's the MSRP and there's a holdback. In other words, they inflate that price up to five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and if you get it, they'll hold that back. In essence, you're paying way more than the MSRP right. because they've they, they've got this holdback built into the price. So I was like, mm-hmm. Another thing, they have advertising fees that they pay. So and and if and if the car is over ninety days old, they have to start paying interest on that car. So they will get rid of that car it's within money. 90 days. Yeah, they got to get rid yeah, of it. Yeah, so what you want to do is find a car that is on the lot for like 87, 88, 89 days. And I said, well, that must be pretty hard because you don't see an invoice or anything. He said, no, no. You go to the door, and there's a sticker on the door, and there's a code. And what you do is you look at the code. You can tell when that thing was shipped. You add two months from the manufacturer date, add two months. And that's when they got that car. And then you take 90 days from there, and now you know how old that car is. Okay. And the older, the closer you get to 90 days, the more willing they are to, to make a deal on that car because they have to pay uh, interest on that, on the right. car after 90 Starts costing days. costing them money after 90 days, yeah. Yeah. There's so many things that, that the, the car dealers do. That, and you got and all this from that guy at the conference. You just... Yeah, and... and <laughs> And what happens is the other thing is they have incentives. So if you go, want, you want to go to a big car dealership because if they sell X number of cars, then they get a bonus from the manufacturer for every car they sold. They'll right. get a thousand or two thousand bucks if they exceed their quota for the year. Large uh, car dealers can yeah. do that. So then you and say, they get rebates you and all that other stuff too that they yeah. they don't yeah. tell you about and. And the other thing, the the one thing I really didn't know about was the loan thing. If you take the loan out with the car company and you you pay on that loan for four, I think it's four months, he told me, then they they get a discount if you finance through the car dealership. So they get a kickback on that. And And if you pay for four months, they get to keep the kickback whether you pay off the loan or not. Ah. So he he told me. Tell the car salesman you want a couple hundred bucks off or whatever the kick pick. I can't remember the exact number, but he says you want X amount of dollars off if I finance with you. But I have my own credit, uh, my credit union that I'm going to get a car loan cheaper. He says, I'll pay for four months, then I'll pay the car off and I'll get my own loan. Do it through the other loan. Yeah, refinance it. And then they said, yeah, most car dealers, dealerships will give you a discount. If you finance through them and pay for four months, yeah, that's so. That's I mean, there's stuff so many. Yeah, and I, I outlined that in the in the truth detector, and I thought, and and it works because my son wanted a car. <laughs> yeah, he, he came. He says, "What can I get? Well, all the best deals." And he didn't have a lot of money. And I said, "Here's what you do." And I told him, he went in and got a super deal using all these techniques. And the guy says, "You must know somebody that sells cars because not many people know these things." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, I and do. I got it all. Well, I got it all through elicitation. Now, if I was to ask that man directly, that salesman directly, tell me everything, he would say, "No, I can't tell you those those things. We don't talk about right trade secrets, baby. Trade secrets. Yeah. But through elicitation, what you're doing is you're predisposing somebody to tell you the truth, and they don't even realize that they're uh, giving you that sensitive information. Very cool. I know. I'd heard that. Um, so you're, um, 
a professor at Western Illinois University. Uh, how long have you been doing that? Nine years. You've been doing that nine years. So you had a little break in between when you retired and when you became a professor? Well, I worked for a, uh, a, uh, a company in Washington okay. for four years. The company or a company? <laughs> a, a company. <laughs> um, and you have your own consulting company. Uh, yes, I, I do a well. lot of training and uh, uh, interviewing, interrogation. Uh, I can imagine you I, travel to a lot of conferences and things like that too, speaker, guest speaker. Yeah, yeah before COVID. Oh, yeah. But since, since, COVID, since COVID hit, I haven't done much in the last couple of years. I, I broke my leg. I had cancer and then COVID hit. So it's been like two and a half, almost three years since I've been out. Are you in remission? Yeah. Oh, good job. I beat it. Oh yeah. I know. I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah. Good, 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 so, good. Now the, but I, I still train some FBI. I still do some FBI classes. Okay. I can imagine you're probably still in that circle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But now the I'm, Western I'm Illinois, you you've got uh, you know nine years under your belt there, um, doing the law enforcement and justice administration. What uh, what are some of the things that your students um, that you're seeing from from the nine years? And I'm sure that technology has advanced a lot. You've seen a lot of advancement in technology with the the Instagram and the the Twitters and the you know all the social media stuff and the texting from your classes that you had nine years ago to the classes that you have today in the, the, the communication skills of your students? Well, they have, they have deteriorated significantly. <laughs> right. Because the, 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 particularly the Z generation, Generation Z, they rely almost totally on social media. They cannot talk to one another. And I do an experiment in my interviewing class. I bring two students that don't know each other up in front of the, class, I put them in two chairs facing one another and say, carry on a conversation for five minutes. Oh my gosh. I bet they can't even look each other in the eyes, can they? They can't do it. And then I take them and I put them back to back and have them sit down in the chairs back to back and say, take out your phones and I'll text one another. And And they're texting like crazy, thumb talking, just punching out all the things. I'm going like, something wrong with this picture. Why can't you sit and talk face to face when you can text very freely? Yeah. Back and forth, but you can't talk face to face. And the other thing I find is the students can't write; they don't know how to write a sentence. Yeah, I'm mean, I'm still working on a big letter in the front and a period in the back of a sentence. <laughs> the punctuations, yeah, yeah, and they don't know. I don't. I and I think because of when they text, they don't use punctuation. No, texting just, is just a quick way to get their thoughts conveyed and, and move on to the next thing. And even abbreviating words, they don't spell the words out, or they'll, they'll use I, the ebonic form of the word, you know. Yeah, and, and the phonetics. students have... Let me, let me say that. Sorry, they have, phonetic. <laughs> yeah, phonetics. And they, and they have told me that, Mr. Schaefer, we just communicate in a different way than when your generation communicated. doesn't make it bad or good, it's just different. The communication style is different. And I said, yeah, but when you go into court and you have to present a, a, a report that's going to take somebody's liberty away from them, you can't text a report. Right. It, it has to be well written. So, yeah, words kind of, have specific meaning too. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I spent a, I spent a good deal of time just trying to get them to learn some basic writing skills, report writing skills. Yeah. Did you have anybody so just drop out of your class just because it was, you know, too much for Oh, you? yeah. One <laughs> one kid, I, I he just said, this is just way too hard for me. He packed his books up, and he was gone. He says, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm dropping out. I said, okay, <laughs> see ya. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to weed them out quick, definitely. Yeah, but there is a big difference in the generations. I think you could probably write a, a you know, a very good – um you know, document or documentary about you know the change in f- since you've been doing it for almost ten years now, um, from when you started to to where kids are today, with their oh commu- yeah com- Big, communication skills. Yeah, and they're you know what what was a telltale sign? I, I was I was talking to the millennials, and I was saying that ah, you guys don't know how to communicate face to face. You're always texting, and they told me they said hmm, you think we're bad. 
wait till our younger brothers and sisters get here. Oh yeah. They are more entitled than we are. They 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 can they write less. They're they they want more free stuff and and I said, well, how yeah. can that possibly? Yeah, how could that possibly be? Well, last semester I had a 101 class, and I called them millennials, and they said, no, 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 we're Gen Z. Oh my, we're gosh. different than millennials. And they said they believe in global government and you know all the socialist kind of uh, yeah. philosophy. Yeah. And they want free college, free work, well, you free know, and that's medical, what, free. That's what we're seeing now in in our uh, everyday news there with these riots and everything that are going on with these demonstrations. You know, that's yeah. That's that's and these Gen Zers. We're we're in a uh, a cultural, I think, cusp. We're transitioning from you know, I, I hate to see, you know, we're we're in transition. I don't know where, what's the end of the transition but we're in transition yeah there there's definitely a a a bump in the the way things have been over the past 10 years no doubt now of course being older i i crave the old ways (laughs) well me too absolutely i'm i'm 50 so yeah i'm i'm still of the old ways (laughs) (laughs) it's just yeah it's just beyond me the way that uh, our generations, our current generations, are are addressing things and handling things. Um, their demonstrations, I guess, physically the way that they are uh, portraying things. But that, well, that gets me to my next thing that I want to talk about. But go ahead, finish your thoughts. No, there. I was going to say what those young, young people should do. I've been all over the world. They should go to a foreign country and then come back, and they would realize how fortunate they are to be born in America and live in America. Right. But if they would teach that in our schools instead of trying to hide that and, you know, hide history and delete history, history is doomed to repeat itself. You know, and that's... Yeah, we, we, may, not be, we may not be perfect, but number two is a long way off. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a big gap between what we got here and what, what the next best thing is. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about was was just that in, you know, the news, the way news is presented these days and the way people get their news is a lot different than how they did in our days. Um, Oh yeah. How, how can we, you know, as we're listening and we're watching and, you know, we're seeing this stuff because you do not only uh, oral and physical recognition, but you do written recognition as well. How can we tell when, you know, we're getting fed a line of BS with, with these news medias and these, these outfits. Well, when when somebody's asked a direct question, you expect a direct answer. If you ask somebody a yes or no question, you expect a yes or no answer. If a person can't answer yes or they can't answer no or don't want to answer yes or no, they go to that middle ground between yes and no, and I call that the land of is, based <laughs> off Clinton's response, what is the meaning of the word is? Uh-huh. So all that is is that vague area between yes and no. That there's innuendos, half truths, word, word, verbal judo, and word, word confusion. Verbal judo. So, I love that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a direct question. Do you believe this? And I can't answer yes or no because I'm going to I'm going to uh, disenfranchise somebody if I answer. Yeah. So I'm going to go into the land of is and kind of convolute things. And then misdirect and move on. And that's where the and, politicians live. They live in the is land. <laughs> yeah, they the live in the land of is. is. Yeah, and and that's what I notice a lot about uh, the well the the debates the debates particularly coming up yeah one tomorrow here here in Tennessee here in Nashville my neck yeah. of the woods. So you'll see a lot of land of is. You'll see a good. You can get a good. Uh, I guess a tour of the land of is by listening to both sides. Yeah. And it's my understanding they're they, actually going to let them talk this time. They're going to have a mute button or something, and they're going to. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's what I heard. A mute button. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, they're going to have the camera on both of them, and as that one's muted, he's going to be making those facial expressions. You know that we can. But can read sometimes that's, on. sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's not good. Yeah, because if you're always rolling your eyes and making faces, it it sends a bad message to people. Yeah, 
Well, I can imagine that these politicians have been well schooled, also. Well, you think yeah. they would have been. Uh, yeah, some I, are very I, questionable, but <laughs> no, I think most of them are well schooled, either through experience or through people like me telling them this is how you have to portray yourself. Yeah. It's called perception management. How do I want? The, another person to view me. Mm -hmm. It may not be, we set up, remember we talked about primacy? Mm -hmm. We want people to view somebody the way we want them to view that person, not the way that person actually sees in reality. Right. So there's a lot of the primacy going on with the ads. You know, you see a lot of ads that, that uh, will set up uh, the way they want people to view their candidate. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're a lot of filth. They do the ads for a reason. Yeah. It's, oh yeah. This is how you need to perceive this person. And we're and spoon feeding well, you how to perceive them that way. One perfect example is three out of four people or three out of four dentists recommend this particular toothpaste brand, right? Yeah. That's well, for dentists, four, four, four out of five dentists or three out of two or whatever dentists say it's good. It must be good. So they're setting up a primacy filter through which they want you to see that toothpaste. Yeah. And beer commercials do it with the women. Oh, Lord. So Sex sells, you, right? Yeah. If you, if, if you drink this beer, look at all the pretty women that are going to be flocking around you, <laughs> or, uh, as in the commercials. Or it makes them look prettier <laughs> the more you drink. <laughs> well, it does. It, <laughs> there, is, there is some truth to that, too. <laughs> the old beer goggles, right? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so as these trained professionals are, you know, in our face, in our ear, you know, especially during this time with with the election, is there is there a way to see through even a trained professional or is it just, you know, you're well, just you can see through it and you tell yourself the guy's not telling me the truth. But how are you going to prevent that as as a, a, a dis detached observer? Right. You, you can't. All you can do is think that's not true. Or you do the research on your own and just don't take their word for it. And yeah, you know, that, that's the other yourself. thing. That's the other thing that we don't do or don't have time to do. In my, in the old, in the old ways, I used to read a number of newspapers, look at, you know, different radio, uh, radio and, or see, uh, listen to different radio shows. And, and there was this uh, thing called a library back in our day too, and you could go to the yeah. library and. <laughs> yeah, and and nowadays what happens? Well, nowadays what happens is people only get their their news from one, typically one source, and if that source sets up the primacy of of a viewpoint, then that's all they're going to see the world through. But in my day, we were taught, okay, that's one viewpoint. Let's go to the opposite side. So if you look at CNN, you got to look at Fox. If you see the New York Times, you got to look at the Washington Examiner or the New York Post. You, you need a balance so then you can get all the information and then say, aha, there's got to be middle ground where the truth Form is. Form your own opinion. Yeah, but we don't have time to read books. We don't have time to read newspapers. And, and we don't certainly look at different sources we get our news from. Yeah, or we so take I the like very first at, Google search that we come to, and we go to that very first Google search and take that as fact. Yeah, I like looking at CNN, Fox. I like listening to NPR. I like listening to all the radio I stations, yeah. all the TV stations, and then I can form my own opinion. Yeah, And, and that kind of neutralizes all the uh, fake uh, uh, answers that are out there or the fake stories or... Right, so education is your best your best tool to be able to to detect through the BS that you're that you're hearing, especially from right. these, these politicians. Is do the research yourself. Go like Jack said. You got to take multiple sources, and you got to take both sides of it because everybody's got a little truth in all their lives. You know, there's a little bit of truth yep. that that lies in there. And as you're listening to Trump or you're listening to Biden or whoever it is. Uh, you're just going to get this feeling because you've you've got this knowledge now, and what you're going to say, well, what he's saying just doesn't seem right. Right, that's what you're going to come up with. But you need the knowledge in your head. Got to educate. To fall back on to make that assessment. Yeah. And if you don't make that, you don't have the knowledge in your head to make the assessment. Then you're going to go w whichever way the wind is blowing. Yeah. Or and that whichever way your crew is is pushing you. Yeah. Right. You know, don't so. be, don't be afraid to uh, disagree with your crew. So, um, 
there was another thing I want to talk about was, uh, so in the media, you know, we talked about the media. So the COVID uh, is another big issue there too. And there's, you know, there's conflicting information on the COVID. Same thing is you got to do your own research with that. Um, right. But uh, the way to do that is, is to, like you say, I mean, we used to go to the library in the old days. Yeah. Now you can, you can actually go online and find actual research online for free at many of these sites. Yeah. So, but it takes time to do that and people don't have the time to do that. Well, they don't want to make the time. They've got the time. They just, you know, if it really means that much to you, you'll make the time and you'll do it. Um, but yeah, you've got to, and, and even there, you, you've got to take different, not just one source. You got to, you got to research many different sources. So that really kind of covers what I, you know, in today's, uh, environment, so, social media and that kind of stuff, uh, how to address this. The the hearings that we just heard with uh, Amy Coney Barrett. Um, right. Did you watch those at all? Oh, yeah. I was glued to the TV. I was fascinated. Okay. She is probably the, the most intelligent Supreme Court nominee that we've had in, in certainly my generation. Yeah. My lifetime. That- I, I found her to be incredibly sincere honest and uh, i like that she's conservative and that she she can believe in her views without being ashamed of the political correctness that that typically fires or attacks those views right without getting into the politics of it well for the for the nature of the hearing and what it was about yeah i think she did an excellent job in the questions that she you know the unfair questions that she was being asked by uh, a lot of the uh, the senators you, there, she she handled them well. You know why I think she did? Because she's a professor. And you know how many t- times I have to face students who think they know everything? Oh, my god! And they're always confronting me with weirdo questions and obtuse things. Uh-huh. And you don't want to call them idiots. And condescending. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be condescending. So what you do is you find a nice way to tell them in a very nice way. You, you know that that idea you came up with is no good. All right. So you very gently tell them that, and and I saw her doing that in the in the hearings. She very gently told these people, not everybody has that perspective. Yeah. You may have got that just a little bit wrong, and she did it in such a nice way. It made people feel good. Yeah. You know. I'm so it glad wasn't that like you, that. you said that because that, I mean, that's what I was getting from her too. And I was just going to ask, you know, from her demeanor and her, you know, body language. And of course the people that were questioning her, I mean, they were just all over the place with their, you know, their emotions and their demeanor. Um, were you getting anything from that? And uh, I think you just answered my question. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, she was able to, I thought very, very cleverly answer very tough questions. Oh yeah. And she, and she knew, and a couple of times she said, you know, I wondered where you were going with the, the question. <laughs> like uh, Kamala Harris asked her, do you, do you think cancer causes, uh, cigarettes cause cancer? Do you think COVID is a dangerous disease? Mm-hmm. And she, it, that's a, a technique used to set somebody up to answer a question a certain way. Right. And I said, I know what she's doing. I use that in interviewing technique. That is a interviewing technique to set people up to answer a certain way. Like she read and my she, book. <laughs> yeah. And then when she got to that, the, the, the trick question, she says, aha, I knew what you were up to. Mm. Or she says, I certainly was wondering what you're up to. Now I know what you're up to. You're trying to get me to do this. And she used another technique and that's called label it. And that protects you, protects you from, uh, somebody taking advantage of you. If you, then that's the important thing about these elicitation techniques in the book, is that you be able to recognize when somebody's using them on you. You name it and claim it. In other words, you say, "I know exactly what you're doing." Mm-hmm. Call and them then out. once you, name, you call them out. Once you name it, then you're inoculated from it. And a good example is the there's a technique and uh, it goes back to my son when he was buying that car. Mm-hmm. There's a technique called the puppy dog technique. So my, my son looked at him and said, you're using the puppy dog technique. And he goes, oh, <laughs> you the must salesman. know something. <laughs> what? The salesman? the salesman? Yeah, the salesman was amazed that 
my son knew the puppy dog technique. So he oh, says, you must gosh. know somebody in the business. Oh, yeah. Yeah, was that and the course, technique where, like, you know, if I take this back to my boss, this offer back, he's going to be mad at me, and he's going <laughs> to... Yeah, 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 the old puppy dog technique. Yeah. And they try to... And the other thing they try to do is sell you a payment. I said, I don't want to buy a payment. I want to buy a car. How much yeah. are you willing to sell this car for? Forget the payment. Right. That's my business. How, how I pay for it, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know how much you're going to sell that car for. Yeah. Uh, we're a lot alike, I mean, as far as our way of thinking... Uh, and I did, uh, my minor was in behavioral psychology also. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's just, I mean, everything that you're saying is just like, this is, this is what I do. This is how I've lived my life. And, and for people who haven't, I mean, these books are, are essential. They're keys and they're, they're really going to help you and not just, you know, your career, but just your life in general, uh, and, and building better relationships and, and stronger relationships. So uh, make sure that you guys are going. Where can they go get these books? Where can they well, right, find them? Right now with COVID, I guess Amazon's the best place to get or Audible. Yeah. Most of our sales are Audible now. Which I really 80, enjoy. 80% 80, 80 of our sales are, are Audible because people like, and I, I, I've been listening to audio books for 30 years. So it's really catching on now and people would rather get information listening while they're doing something else. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the prime example is when I'm at the gym, you know, I've, yeah, exactly. I'm listening to, to podcast or news or something like that. You know, that's where I'm getting caught up and you know, getting informed, well, I guess. That's what I tell my students. They're walking around ca campus with earphones on and all that. And I said, look, I know you're listening to music, but why don't you listen to an audio book? Yeah. And you can always, you know, bebop and move your hands around and mouth some words. And they'll think you're listening to music when you're actually learning something. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And they go like, oh, I didn't know that. And I said, and the books are free from the Gutenberg Project. You can get thousands and thousands of audio books for free. Ooh, I didn't know that. It's the Gutenberg Project? Yeah. Gutenberg Project. Is that a get, website? Yeah. It's, uh, it's The Gutenberg Project is a government-funded project that wants to... Uh, Audio and uh, uh, make available through print ebooks all the books in like, history, like those Kindle books that you can read. Yeah, but they got yeah. the audio and they've got those. Okay, digital digital right. books. It, yeah, yeah, that's right, digital books. So it's our own brains. <laughs> yeah, I know they they want to they want to digitize these books and they want to make them available in audio audio. So if you go there, you can download it and listen to. A, a lot, a lot of books, thousands and thousands I'm of books. I'm going to write that, the Gutenberg Project. And when I found it, I went like, my gosh, there's thousands and thousands of books. Yeah, that's yeah. gold. So, and you just download them and listen to them, and then you can just erase them and download another one. Yeah, for those those uh, those of us like, my, like me that are my age, you know, I want a hardback, you know, I want something tangible, you know, in my hand. Yeah. I want a book. Uh, I guess I can order it off Amazon or something like that. And then bookstores. Yeah, Amaz yeah. Amazon is probably the best way. Audible or Amazon. Apple has a, the uh, the uh, digital. Okay. Uh, Barnes and Noble, but I don't know how many of those bookstores are open. Uh, they are. They're open in our our town, Murfreesboro. I'm in Tennessee here. Uh, they've pretty much lifted all the the COVID stuff. So. Yeah, we're shutting down in Illinois. I'm from Chicago area, and we're shutting down as of Friday. You know, we're closing all the the bars and restaurants. Well, come on to Tennessee, and we'll do a you know we'll do a book <laughs> tour for you here in Tennessee, and push and promote yeah, your, your books. I'd be I'd be open to that. Heck yeah, heck yeah. I mean, we have we have like range day events and things like that where we've had authors come to our range day events and um, you know talk yeah. about their books and stuff. So. Uh, I mean, if that's something that interests you, I'd be happy to to get you uh, in that yeah. circle. I could do that. Uh, I'd do it as long as, as long as the COVID isn't raging its ugly head. Yeah, well, I think we're pretty we're pretty good here in Tennessee. So uh, either way, I gotta be I gotta be especially careful because of the cancer. Oh, the doctor well, said I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm very vulnerable to uh, pre-existing conditions. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
Founded in 2012, IWIUS is the USA-based subsidiary of Israel Weapon Industries Limited of Ramat Hasharon, Israel. The IWIUS line of products includes the Tavor X95, the Uzi Pro pistol and SMG, the Galil Ace line of firearms, and the belt-fed Negev line of light machine guns. IWI's mission is to bring the highest quality firearms with real world proven reliability to the U.S. commercial and law enforcement market. IWI US are proud sponsors of the Talking Lead AK Corner and the Lead Head Brigade. Check us out at www.iwi.us and on social media under IWI US. So, Jack, I've got this line of questions that I asked my new guest. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with those, if that's okay. That's all right. Okay. So, Far away. <laughs> so, this isn't going to be the hearing. This isn't going to be a, like the, the spring corner, is it? <laughs> It'll be a little more fun than that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it a little bit more than, than uh, Miss Barrett did hers, or Judge Barrett. You die, you die, you die. And sometimes a girl. Questions. So, growing up. You, uh, you're from the Chicago area, is that right? Yes, sir. Born and born and reared in Chicago. South, south side Chicago. South side, you're southy. Um, what what are some of the? I mean, obviously, I mean, we know Chicago. It's a rough area. Talk about some of the the more, I guess, challenges that you had growing up. I mean, obviously, you pulled yourself out of that and very successful and uh, educated yourself. Uh, what are some of the key factors that drove you to the success that you are today? Well, I think number one, I grew up in uh, one of 10 kids. Wow, so, big family, okay. Yeah, there was a lot of competition when we were growing up for resources and food at the dinner table. and Attention, and just those, attention, yeah. Attention, and and because we were, we, we were let go at 6 in the morning, and we didn't have to get home till like 6 at night, so we wandered the neighborhoods, and you can end up getting in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So maybe you could say I was precocious as a youngster in Chicago. <laughs> and I think the, the main thing that got me uh, direction was I, I joined the Army. Ah, okay. and, and that gave me discipline, direction, and kind of set me straight as to what life's all about. Absolutely. So I credit the military. I credit the military for giving me uh, direction, discipline, strength, leadership skills, all those things that you 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 think about when you think military. Yeah. So that's one major thing. The other major thing is I became a Christian, and without God's help and blessing, I don't think I'd be where I'm at today. Yeah. So I have to give God credit for any talent that He's given me, any success in my career in the bureau. Or, or as an author, I have to attribute that to him. And that gives me purpose in life. It gives me a sense of belonging. I know where I stand in time and space continuum. And I, know where I'm, and I know where, where I'm going to go when I'm dead. I will be spending eternity in, in heaven with God. Go. So, and I know religion is a tough topic, but without Jesus, I, I don't think I would be where I'm at. It's what this country was founded on, and people forget that. Yeah. And God blessed me by curing me of the cancer. So obviously, He's Amen. got some. He's got something for me to do. And after going through that, I don't want to know what it is because that was a tough ordeal to go through. Yeah, my father so, went, uh, had cancer too, so. I'm and if he's it's prepping me deal. for something large, I don't want to know what that is until it gets there. <laughs> well, it's not this show, so you still got many years, so don't worry about that. <laughs> so, but you were in the Army, so what did, uh, did you do in the Army? What was your specialty in the Army? I was a helicopter mechanic. Oh, mechanic, okay. Yeah, and that, and I, I, uh, and when I got out of the service, I became an A&P. I got my A&P license. Yeah based on my experience in the service and education. So it gave me a great foundation for life. And then I went to the college on the GI Bill. Yeah. So the, the, great, the three years I spent in the program. Army. Yeah. So the, the, the Army was the foundation, my launching pad. 
Is that where you for, got your aviation uh, uh, skills for flying? Today? Yes. 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 So they had flying clubs in the Army, so I would join the flying clubs and get my license. And, and yeah. then it's coincidental. I, I don't believe in coincidences, but the FBI hired me. There was 16,000 qualified applicants for 325 positions one year. Wow. And they, wow. Ha- they happened to be looking for pilots. So my the pilot training, <laughs> well, I don't believe in the luck of the draw, but yeah. I think it's, it's a uh, divine intervention, well, you sure, know, yeah. Yeah. and, and I believe that if, if I hadn't been a pilot, they probably wouldn't have hired me. So they happen to be having a shortage of pilots. So they hired me. Nice. So if only they were looking for pilots when I applied, <laughs> <laughs> did you apply? I did. Well, the TBI. The uh, Tennessee oh, Bureau yeah, of, of, yeah. of guys, right out of college. The other thing that the, the military gave me was 10 bonus vet points. Oh, okay. In the federal government, you, you do your application, you get your score. They say you're very competitive. And then they said, we're going to add an additional five points because you're a vet. And I went from like 89 to a 92. Oh, wow. It bumped you up. Three. And they said, now you're highly competitive. And you're a pilot, so now you're even higher. So. Well, and you spoke a, a foreign language too, Korean. No, the, I, 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 the bureau sent me to language school. Oh, you learned that there? Okay. Yeah, I got you. Because I know that's a, a big thing that they look for. Also, is the bureau. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking. If you know, like right now, Chinese, Urdu, Farsi, Arabic, yeah. Arabic. Uh, the easy languages they have a lot of people, like Spanish, German, French. Right. It's the more difficult ones they're looking for. Yeah. All right. Next and question. Computer science. Is um, so you're in the FBI. You're in the, you're in the military. How old were you when you joined the army? Uh, nineteen. I was in the Merchant Marines before that. Oh, okay. So I graduated from high school and went right into the Merchant Marines. How was that? Talk about the Merchant Marines a little bit, because I I don't think I've ever really talked to anybody who was in the Merchant Marines. Well, it's uh, merchant vessels. It, I, we primarily worked the Great Lakes, went from the iron ore uh, mines up in Minnesota, Duluth, mm-hmm. and then we would take all the iron ore down to the steel mills. Oh, okay. In Chicago and in uh, Pittsburgh and Toledo, Toledo, Toronto, all all through the Great Lakes. Yeah. So that was interesting. I was eighteen at the time. You're eighteen. And yeah, it was a whole new world. I thought I was. Tough Chicago kid from the street. <laughs> yeah, that showed you what tough was. I, uh. <laughs> when I went to the Merchant Marines, that was uh, I was a kindergartner. I got gotcha. you. You know, so that's a. It was an interesting thing to do. It was hard work. Yeah, but I got paid pretty well. Well, I would say that's and another then, thing that probably led to your discipline too. You know, your character building character. I, I'm sure that built a lot of character being in the Merchant Marines. Oh, that built a lot up. My eyes were open to the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, that not many people see. Like reality. So anyway, world. yeah. So then I went to uh, the Army, and then I went to, then I decided after the Army, I, I was, I, I made up my mind, I'm going to get educated, and I'm going to, you know, make a positive contribution. So I went to school then. Being in the military, I mean, you were exposed to firearms. What was your what was your earliest exposure in, of to firearms, and what was the first one that you ever shot? First one I ever shot was uh, M sixteen. Okay. In the army, uh, and then I in the police academy, I I I shot the best uh, score in the history of the police academy. That's so impressive. I got, you know, they have a 10 ring, uh, uh, well, you know, the 10 rings, uh, uh, score or the silhouette. Yeah. Where they have the 10 ring, the X, the 10 ring and nine, yeah. eight, seven. Yeah. I've got one over here. Yeah. I shot uh, 38 in the X and the rest were in the 10 ring. Look at you go, man. Not natural. Yeah. Yes. Well, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like the gun I have. I like, but I'm not like a gun fanatic. Yeah. But I like the gun. I, I wanted to become an expert at the gun they gave me. Sure. And then when I went into the FBI, I, I won the, uh, called the, the Possible Club. You start out at the 60, run to the 50, 
run to the 25, run to the seven and shoot 50 rounds. Yeah. I, I shot a hundred percent on that one. Uh, and you, we, we, we reloaded with speed loaders. We didn't have, it was a, no, it was a Smith and Wesson. What was a large frame K frame. And it was, uh, we used 38 plus P's. Okay. I got you. And then we had speed loaders and pouch loaders. <laughs> so you're using oh. the revolvers then. Yeah, and then we we had the extra rounds in our pocket. Just floating around there like change. So what we do is we had two <laughs> speed loaders, we had one pouch, and the rest is in our pocket. And then we had to simulate different things at the 50, run from the 60 to the 50, and then to the 25, and and it was all timed. Yeah. i got a buddy who uh, is in federal law enforcement. I was, I was actually trying to get him to co-host with me today. Um, but he runs those um, proficiency tests for yeah. some of the agencies now, too. But now it's all changed. So they they went to the I think they're on the the Glock now. They used to do the two two six. The Sigs, yeah. Yeah, the Sig two two six. Some of them they Is let that, they still let them choose on on what to do. So I guess it depends on what department you're in on what you're using. So different departments yeah. are using different. Um, when I knew they had wheel gun that they gave me was brand new out of the box and I had it for 18 years. Really? And, and I kept saying, no, I didn't want to transition because I knew that gun. And I knew if I was in a, a fight with the thing that I knew where the bullet would go. Right. Because I was so comfortable with that gun and that I didn't want to transition to a new weapon, but I had to go to the, the, the SIG 226 and, you know, the I do well on that. Yeah, yeah, I did well on that, but I, I like the wheel gun. Man, you had that for 18 years. Now, did they give you the opportunity to to buy that? or? No, I wish they would have. They they packed them all up and sent them to South America to the police departments down there and sold them. Oh, my gosh. That was your baby, too. I bet that was a Yeah, hard... I know. I was. I really <laughs> liked that gun. <laughs> right? <laughs> I guess, but I won, the, I won that possible club with it. You know, I, I got the award. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm good at shooting, but it's not my passion. Well, sure. I, I don't know well, if that sure. makes sense. No, it makes it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's So it's not everybody's passion, you know, but some people some people do it just because, you know, for self-defense or, you know, whatever, you know, it's it's an obligation to them, but and a lot of my it's friends not were for saying everybody. My, and they're saying, "My gosh, I love guns and I shoot guns all the time." but I'm not very good at it. And you are very good at it, natural talent, and you don't like them. I, it doesn't make sense. They want He wants to switch. <laughs> He's like, let's <laughs> trade places, buddy. <laughs> but I don't know. It's just another one of those skills that I just happen to be good at. Well, I mean, I think you're probably pretty pretty good at anything that you set your mind to that you want to be good at from what I'm hearing. So when it comes to unwinding, let's see how good you are at unwinding and relaxing. What do you like to do to just – chill exercise i love to write well when i was in the in the fbi i exercised three four five times a week and that i was able to de-stress i cross-country ski i would bike i would run do you like cardio uh, cardio and racquetball i love racquetball yeah tennis the old shoulder I, don't like it though <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I ran into that problem. Now, as I get older, I still I still go, you know, back to exercising, but I ride my bike now. Yeah. If I ride 30, 40 miles a day, oh, I come wow. back, I'm, I'm tired. I'm ready for a nap. Are you doing the and outdoor then, cycling or you got yeah, an indoor cycle? Yeah, outdoor. Nice. So you're the, getting out. The, the thing is, when you exercise and you're tired, you have you have no room for anxiety. It does relieve anxiety. It's so Yes, it does, because you can't be anxious when you're exhausted. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you're too tired to be so, anxious. And, and that's what I tell the young kids getting into the police field now, especially. They have to have balance in their life. And the other balance we got in, in, in our lives is my wife was a police officer, too. I met her on the job. And so we made a pact with each other that we would not have, we would separate our police friends from our regular off-duty friends. So... On duty, we had friends. Off duty, we had friends that were not police officers. Right to get out of. So that. we didn't talk. We didn't talk, talk cop shop twenty four hours a day, and that causes a lot of anxiety. Right, constantly talking about cop talk. So we separated everything, 
And we wouldn't talk about the job unless life or limb was at stake. Like sure. if you almost get shot one day, you come home and say, I almost got shot tonight. Well, that's okay. But we didn't want to mix uh, the business with, with the home life. Sure. Yeah, it could be detrimental, so, definitely. So I always tell people you need balance. you got to find some balance in your life. You can't just be a cop and live a cop 24-7. Yeah, law you go, enforcement has probably the highest divorce rate. Yeah, oh, yeah, because we have odd hours and, and there's a lot of uh, shenanigans going on. Yeah, and stress relief. Yeah, and like you said, not being able to leave work at work, you bring it home with them. Yeah. It makes it stressful on so everybody. It, it worked out for us. What kind and of bike do you out. have? I have a specialized cross trainer. Nice. Is it the uh, titanium or uh, not titanium, but no, that's I, the real yeah, carbon I fiber? It, no, I bought it in 2007, so it's aluminum. Okay, it's so you get a good workout pick, lifting it up and <laughs> yeah, it around too. <laughs> no, it works. Get I'm some not gonna, tricep. I, I used to do that with my bike. I had a Schwinn uh, twelve speed, and uh, I would get tired. You know, when I get tired of riding, I'd get off the bike, and then I would do, you know, oh, do triceps that. and stuff like that while I was uh, walking back home. So. Yeah, when I well, when I was twenty three, I I uh, I went into the merch uh, the uh, Marine Corps Reserve active Marine Corps Reserve, and I met two Marines, and we uh, bicycled from Springfield, Illinois, to San Diego, California, on our oh. Schwinn 10-speeds back then. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Took us, that hurt the old crotch. <laughs> yeah, that took us 30 days, but we took every Sunday off. So it took us 22 days of riding. So to you get are off. into fitness, so that's that's cool. So we talk yeah, fitness. Yeah, but I'm, old, I'm older now. I can't, uh, well, I can't do it. All the more reason for us to continue our, you know, our uh, athletic lifestyles, you know, so we can stay mo. And I'm having the old hips and knee problems right now, but I feel, yeah. I feel much better after I've gone to the gym and, you know, stretched yeah. and, and done some exercising. But if I lay around for, you know, a day or two without hitting the gym, then that's, you know, it gets worse. Yeah. Well, the the bike season's coming to an end, so I'll pick up swimming. Oh, you see, you swim also, okay. Yeah, because it's, I had to take the bike because I have knee and foot and hip problems. Yeah. So the bike, there's it's no stress on that. And then swimming, there's no stress. Yeah. I take it so, you got an indoor pool that you're going to being in, <laughs> in well, Chicago. Well, at the university, in the university, they have a huge pool. Oh, okay. yeah. So you get Western. access to that. So friends yeah. benefits of work, right? Yeah. So that's nice. They have, a, they have a very nice gym down there at Western. Excellent gym. How about diet? Uh, what are you doing? Um, I mean, if you're working out just, that much, I'm I, sure you've got a pretty specialized diet too. Yeah, I eat when I'm hungry. I drink when I'm dry. If yes. don't kill me, I live till I die. <laughs> I <laughs> love so, that motto. That's a great and I motto. Asked, I, asked my, I asked my doctor once, should I start eating nuts and berries? And he said, no. Eat what you want to eat because there will come a time in your life when you can't eat it. And you want to look back and say, I never missed a chance to eat my favorite food. There you go. What is your favorite food? Being in Chicago, from oh, Chicago. Well, I like I like a beef. Italian beef is good. Yeah. I don't know if you ever had a Chicago Italian beef or Chicago hot dogs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been to, yeah. I've been to Chicago before. Been there a few times. Chicago pizzas are good, too. Pizza in Chicago is excellent. Chicago's got good food. I don't like the the deep dish pizzas. I like the thin crust. No, I don't either. Yeah, yeah. I like a thinner crust. Yeah, get more medium the, crust is okay. Deep dish, not so much. I'm not. I'll eat it. I'm not big on but, bread. I don't do a lot of bread. But I'll. Well, uh, I do bread. Because so, there'll come a time when the doctor says I can't eat bread, and I'll look back and say I never miss an opportunity to eat bread. To eat bread. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. And you probably don't have a lot of time for this either, but um, when it comes to like pop culture, what is your go-to? Whether it's a movie, a TV show, a you know maybe a book or magazine, what what do you enjoy in that realm like, of things? I like the old movies on um, Turner Classic Movies. Turner Classics. Yeah, I love the old movies. I like Perry Mason. I like all the old shows. Hey, there's a new Perry Mason out now. Yeah, that's what I heard, but I don't know if it's going to be the same as I watched, the old one. I watched one episode of it, and 
it's you know they don't set it in modern times. It's still set it back in oh okay in, in the fifties. Yes, and that's what I liked okay. about it. So I I think you might find it appealing. Yeah, but I I like move, I like reading. I I read a lot, or I listen auto. You know I it, yeah. Some people say it's not reading, but I I think it is. Because if you look in the dictionary, it says reading is the acquisition of knowledge. It doesn't say through the written word or the oral or word. It doesn't have to come so, through the eyeballs, does it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can read with so your like ears, to too. I like to read, exercise, write. I, I like to write. I write a blog for Psychology Today magazine. Oh, okay. And that's where I got the uh, the bio that I read was from Psychology Today. Is that a, How often do you do that blog? I do it about uh, right now. I'm about once a month. Okay. So they can just go like, there and search your name and find all your your yeah, blogs. Yeah, I've written like 135 blogs. I got 7.2 million reads. Nice. Very good. So that's over a number of years. Over all the blogs, it's life. Yeah. Lifetime. Uh, so Perry Mason, that's a good one. <laughs> What about movie wise? What's what's like your your all time favorite go to? You can just sit down and watch over and over again movie. The Man Who Would Be King oh. by Rudyard Kipling. I don't know if you've heard of that. James Conn was in it. I know James Conn, but I don't think I've I haven't seen that movie. What's it about? Yeah, these these guys in the eighteen hundreds in India wanted to go off and make make riches and be kings. So they went off into the Hindu Kush, which is, you know, Afghanistan and that area. Yeah. And back then it was very rural, but they were able to uh, develop an army and conquer great lands. And and their pride is what did them in. Yeah. Because they thought that the tribes thought they were gods and they went too far. Uh. And so it's just it's just an example of how pride you you can have good intentions, but sometimes you get so wrapped up in yourself that you become very prideful, mm-hmm. and, and that's your downfall. So too much of good something. Little, is, good lesson is there not, in that movie, yeah. The so man, I could watch that. The man who would be king? Yeah, the man who would be king. It, it's a story. I read the, the novel. It's based on Rudyard Kipling's novel, The, the Man Who Would Be King. Well, I wonder if they've got that one at the uh, Gutenberg. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Sean Connery was the other guy. Oh, I love Sean Connery. Sean. He's yeah, like, he was in there. He's like one of my favorite actors. I hated that he quit acting. Yeah, but but that book is just it's just like you, and I think most people are like this when you get good at something and then if you let it get away from you, then it's your downfall. Yeah. So I'm always conscious you know, God has a way of humbling people. Your greatest asset could very quickly turn to be your Achilles heels. Yeah. So what I try to do is is be mindful that you have to, you know, stay a bit humble. You seem to you seem to be keeping it pretty well in check. Uh, yeah, my wife makes sure of that too. Well, that helps, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have an accountability partner, right? <laughs> yeah. If, if I'm if I'm stepping out a little too too large. Put you back in place. <laughs> yeah, just say, mm-hmm. take the garbage out. <laughs> Wives are Clean good for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, if you could own anything, what would you own? What? What? Right now, if you laws be damned, money be damned. If you could own anything, what would you have? If I could own anything. Mm-hmm. I, right now, I'd want a new bike. <laughs> a new bike, okay. Yeah. There's that humbleness coming out. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I've been thinking about it, and I was thinking, hmm, if I get a little extra money, but bikes are expensive. Yeah, they the kind of. Yeah. Yeah, the Santa Cruz uh, camouflage is what I got my eye on. What are those running these days? About thirty five hundred. Oh, okay. That's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. You could probably find you well, a good used one. No, I don't want to use one. You know, you want a brand new I, one? <laughs> I want to break it in. You want somebody else's junk on that seat? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe if if it, I might take a cruise. Okay. To the Antarctic. To the Antarctic. That would be cool. 
we were scheduled to go on a cruise in January to Antarctic, but they canceled it. What partic- What's particular about the Antarctic that uh, you're drawn to? I've never been there. Just never been there? You like to go? Never been. Yeah, I've been all over the world, and there's not much to see out there. There's not much to see in Antarctica either. It's a bunch of white. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm, what I'm saying is people are people no matter where you go in the world. And that's one thing I found out. We have the same basic needs, the same basic wants, the same people are people. And it's it's like what I teach is the behavioral analysis. When I teach that, I say, here's a cake of core human behaviors that all people experience no matter where they're at. But, but there's a culturally specific frosting that you put on the cake. Right. So the cake's the same. This is a frosting's different. So if you go to Africa or Asia, you – you have to put your own specific frosting on that cake. Right. And that what g- gives you the ability to talk to a lot of people and understand human nature. Yeah. And that's what I tried to bring out in all those books is the basic core human behaviors. So like the like switch was printed in 20 different languages. Oh, okay. So it's because it's a cro- publication. Why? Because it's got what? Core human behaviors. Everybody could benefit from it. Yeah. Yes. We eyebrow flash, head tilt and smile, no matter where you're at in the world. We we want to correct others no matter where you are in the world. We we want to demonstrate our expertise no matter where you are in the world. So what you want to do is give people the opportunity to do those things, then they will like overshare with you and tell you secrets that they wouldn't normally disclose if they were acted asked a direct question. Right. And- so there's worldwide application, cross-cultural application. So Antarctica, would this be a cruise? Yeah. You want to take uh, it there? Yeah, it was a cruise. We 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 had to apply for it two years to wait because they only have one wow. boat that goes down there one time a year. Yeah, and I'm sure so during this flying, corona they probably have they canceled kind of it. boshed it. Yeah, and I was kind of disappointed. Yeah. I, I read they, something today that uh, – Royal Caribbean or something is starting back, so maybe there's really there's hope. Yeah, this was uh, celebrity. Celebrity, okay. Yeah, they take the cruise down there one time. They go to like Chile and Falkland Islands and and uh, Antarctica, and then they come back. Have you done a lot of cruises? Yeah, I really enjoy cruising. I went on my very first think, cruise in February. This February, I didn't think I didn't think I would enjoy it after being in the Merchant Marines. <laughs> You think he'd I'd had enough I, of ships, right? <laughs> I had enough of ship. But then when I my wife finally talked me into taking a cruise, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yep. I was the same way. I mean, for years she'd been trying to get me to go on a cruise, and I finally decided to do it. And I was like, that's not as bad as I thought it would be, you know? Because I'm always really? thinking, you know, those horror stories that you hear of, uh, you know, the water getting contaminated and the motor breaking yeah. down and the pirates and, you know. Yeah. Not none of that. It's all just myths. Yeah, it is. But I, I certainly enjoy fr- uh, cruising. So I guess I would take a cruise if I had a lot of money. I would just take a cruise. Okay, just do a worldwide cruise kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'd like that. But I found out, you know, I don't need a lot of things. And that's why I'm not wrapped up in the thing thing. Because I just don't have a craving for a lot of things. Yeah. Because they just get in the way. And you got to fix them, and they break down. Maintenance. <laughs> if one thing leads to another, yeah. Yes, the le- the less you have, the better off you are. I think. I think so. Yeah, Minim- minimalist and, lifestyles uh, are probably the and happiest I, and people. I, I am seeing one hearse with a U-Haul. <laughs> told me, told me how it. Can't take I it mean, with you, can you? Can't take it with you. All right, last question. Uh, originally, this question is if you could spend the day at the range with anyone. Uh, whether they're uh, f- alive, have passed, fictional, uh, who would you, or it could be a group of people, who would you spend the day at the range with? And I've I've since modified it. Just who would you, who would you like to spend the day with? Who would you spend a day with? What genre? Are we talking history? Are we talking any time in history? Any or? time in history. Uh, they could be, you know. I said they alive, dead. It could be a fictional right. character. Um, there could well, be a right group now, of people. I, right now, I would love 
to sit down at the range, and I'm sure these guys would be good at it, would be the founding fathers of this country. Oh, man, yeah, that would be great. And and have the knowledge I have now to go back and say, did you have this in mind when you set up that Constitution, especially the Second Amendment? Why did you put the Second Amendment in there? Well, the Second Amendment is in there because the people wanted some way to check the government if they became overruly, if they became tyrants. That's the purpose of the Second Amendment. That is the key so, purpose, yeah, tyrannical government. Yeah. yeah, and then to ask them, because if you look at the First Amendment, those five freedoms in the First Amendment, I think, are all connected in some way, because without assembly, you can't have free speech. You can't have religion. You can't have religion without assembly. I mean, right. they're all interconnected. And you wonder, did they do this on purpose? <laughs> or was it, you, know, you know what I mean? That that Constitution is so... It's not a haphazard uh, document, you know. There's well, how, lots of thought. Ask them, how did you do it? Because a lot of times people will look at the like switch or look at one of the books I've written and say, this is what the author meant. I'm going like, no, I didn't mean that. Right. It wasn't even in my mind when when I wrote. You interpreted that a certain way. So if, if many, so you don't know until you talk to the people who actually wrote it. That's true. That is true. And that, which is why we have all the debate and uh, turmoil with our constitution now. You know, everybody's so trying probably, to interpret it for their own benefit. So probably that influences my decision to to spend some time with the founding fathers. Yeah, that's Just a great out, answer. What did you really mean by when you wrote, or did you just write it and didn't think about it? Yeah. That's possible. And it turned out really well. It's just hard to believe that, though, you know, that they just haphazardly threw that together, you know, and it turned out the way it well, did. And that's why, you know, I kind of believe there was divine guidance in there. A lot of that, when, yeah. When God blessed America, he blessed America tremendously, and I think we're going to lose the blessing. We're, it's in threat. It's definitely in threat. That's that's my greatest fear, is that we'll lose God's blessing on this country. And we are truly, I think, the best country in the entire world. Amen. Absolutely. I'll second so, that motion. And I know all of our leadheads will, too. So, leadheads, yeah. make sure that you go and show Dr. Jack your appreciation for him being on the show. And you do that by buying his books. And you do that at Amazon. You can do it at, what was that other place? Bar Bar Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Audible. Audible, that was the one. Apple, Apple, it's on Apple, what, iTunes, Apple iTunes, that's what it's called, I Apple. So. I don't deal with Apple stuff. I, no. I boycott I Apple. But, <laughs> but boycott. there is one, I'm sure there is one there. There's there's probably a blue bazillion different places. Uh, if you Google or if you search, if you don't use Google, use a different uh, search engine. It's Jack Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-E-R, Ph.D. Uh, if you put FBI behind that, too, you're gonna, you know, it's going to ensure that you get uh, the right Jack Schaefer there. You put his books in, uh, again, The Like Switch, uh, and in his new book, The True Detective. No, The Truth, no, the I'm sorry, The Truth Detector. Detector. <laughs> I'm thinking of that HBO show, True Detective, <laughs> yeah, I know. with Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The Truth Detector is his newest book. Uh, definitely not going to want to miss. I'm going to go get the Audible. These are on Audible, right? They're yes. On. I'm going to go get the Audible of these as soon as we get off here. Uh, but it's been a pleasure having you on, uh, Jack. Thank you so much for being on. You're welcome anytime. Next time you got a new book coming out or you just want to jump on the show and, and hang with us, you're more than welcome to. All right. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed our visit. So that brings us to the end of another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. A, a great one, in my opinion, with Dr. Jack Schaefer. So until the next time, Leadheads, as always, keep your loved ones close. And your firearms closer. And keep your eyeballs flashing, your head tilting, and your face smiling. That's a good one. That was a really good one. <laughs> Perfect. All right.